Our critics are coming out and saying this is an industry on the road to death and destruction. It's certainly not very good PR and it's certainly not a very good image. Sadly, though, at least 40 people have died from last month's gas tanker explosion in Boxburg. I'm sure you remember those devastating visuals. Now, some of the victims, we understand, also still not out of the woods as yet. But I'm sure you would have noticed now there's two reasons for this. Either these incidents with road freight have been happening, just not as well publicized, or more of them are happening. We're going to try and unpack that this afternoon. Uh, to help us answer that, joined by forensic specialist Stan Besedenote, who's been on ENCA before, regular guest, Reed Road Freight Association CEO Gavin Kelly, and Marius van Rienen, who is COO at Mix Telematics Africa. Marius, I hope I said that correctly, Mix uh, Telematics or MIX uh, Telematics, but I'm going to come to you uh, in a, a couple of moments from now. So just to orientate everybody, Stan on my right-hand side in the middle, uh, we have Gavin Kelly, and on the far left, Marius van Rienen. My thanks to all three of you gentlemen. Uh, Stan, let me start with you, forensic specialist uh, on uh, an incident like this. Timelines is what many people are asking. How does it seem to take so long? Are we just impatient when it comes to this? Because it seems to be dragging on a bit. Am I wrong or right? Gareth, yes. Firstly, I want to make it very clear that people are being impatient. It's definitely not normal for cases of this size to be resolved within weeks. I myself have attended crashes back in 2005 that I only first testified in, in 2016. Uh, it's not unnatural for investigations to take a while. The bigger the investigation, the more role players, the more actors that are involved, the more complex the dynamics, the more carefully it's done. So there's a lot that has to happen before this matter in the full final docket gets pre presented to the National Prosecuting Authority, who then makes a decision on who they want to prosecute or whether they want to prosecute, and only then will the case typically see the inside of a courtroom. So it's not like in the movies. I suppose people love it. They watch a TV show, murderer murders somebody. 15 minutes later, the detective's on his trail, mm. and within half an hour, the show's almost o over and the guy's being caught. So it's not like that in reality, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's not. So that's the timeline of how long these things can take. It's almost uh, an indeterminate amount of time, because I suppose we want to get it right as well, and forensic experts want to get it right. Stan, let me ask you this. On the Boxburg incident itself, I'm going to get the thoughts of, of Gavin uh, and, uh, and Marius in just a moment uh, from the association and the tracking perspective. Red Red flags uh, in this particular incident. A lot of people, and again, who are not experts, uh, are questioning the amount of time it took from the initial incident to the incident being reported okay. to when EMS, uh, the fire brigade in this case, arrived at the scene. Were there red flags for you? Did this was this handled badly? Okay, I'm going to be very careful about what I say. I've been engaged in the matter, and I'll probably testify in a court of law on this, so I can't discuss the merits of this case specifically, but I can tell you that in cases of this kind, the red flags would include the following. The first is whether emergency services actually answered calls that are placed. So if you try to call the police and it takes too long for them to answer or the system doesn't work or the fire department or whatever, I came across a pedestrian, in fact, a cyclist crash just last week, I came to the scene, I phoned an emergency number, I must have phoned five times, and all five times I was completely unable to get through to a controller. Eventually, a, a good Samaritan loaded the cyclist into a car, in fact a nurse, and drove him to hospital. So that's the first red flag, is how efficient and effective are our emergency services at accepting emergency calls. The next red flag is because of that and because of those delays, what would the deployment time be of the appropriate services? Keep in mind that a traffic officer can do very little about a fire. Mm. Equally, a fire department can do very little about an armed robbery. So that's the next concern. And then, of course, the issue, the next red flag is how is that incident handled and what is done to mitigate control or eliminate risk? 
Uh, Gavin Kelly, Road Freight Association CEO, also with us in the middle of uh, your screen if you're watching at home, uh, by the way. There's Gavin. I'm sure you recognize him. Uh, regular guest. Uh, people are also wondering about the independent investigations uh, around this. I see there's an article on News24 uh, saying that incidents involving dangerous goods should be independently investigated. I would have thought this would have happened naturally. What did you mean by that, Gavin? Good afternoon. Gavin, maybe just double check the mute for me. I think you might be on mute before you carry on. There we go. Can you hear me now? I got you. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Gareth, and good afternoon, Stan. Um, <laughs> very appreciative of Stan, Stan walking very carefully through, through what he had to say. Well, let's first of all, we said as the association, we need to make sure that this incident is investigated and it has an independent investigation. Most dangerous goods operations have independent auditors that look at their operations. Anybody who's serious about moving dangerous goods across the roads in the country has somebody who comes along and makes sure that whatever they are doing is in terms of the National Road Traffic Act in the first instance, and then in terms of a number of South African national standards in terms of how you package goods, how you uh, move goods, and the sorts of warnings and the signage and the types of, of driving that you would do. And when I say types of driving, I mean the way in which you drive the vehicle and what you would do if you encountered problems. Yeah. So that's important that somebody who's not part of the transport company and was not part of that initial uh, certification, if there was a certification, then has a look at this with fresh eyes to make sure that everything was in place when this operation was taking place. And that's really what we're saying. Is it always done? Unfortunately, no, it isn't always done. And uh, Marius van Rennen, uh, Mix Telematics Africa COO. Again, Marius, correct me if I've mispronounced the company's name. I see you nodding as Gavin Kelly uh, is talking, and I'm sure you're nodding because this is your specialty. Let's talk telematics for a moment and how important that is in an industry like this. Is this standard across the industry, or is it, again, those who can afford the very best do it, the rest who can't end up getting around the regulations? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity this afternoon. The, I think the the reality is that that telematics as, as a as a software as a service has become quite affordable, and and certainly affordability shouldn't be something that would prevent people from having access to the high resolution data that's available today that allows companies to proactively manage risk and incidents like these. Um, certainly. Um, it's fair to say that 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 in the lagging uh, effects of COVID, that that people have made some costing decisions, and whether those impacted this incident, they certainly impact other like or similar incidents uh, from time to time. We know as 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 mix that the impact of high resolution telematics allows people to avoid collisions and accidents on a daily basis. And whether that's utilizing the movement data or the movement information from the vehicle itself, or whether it is leveraging um, the newest in, in technology around video telematics that allows you to manage and co uh, correct driver behavior in real time in the cab, those solutions are, are almost standard in the market today. Something that is quite important to consider is that that oftentimes these these solutions are implemented within uh, with, with, within businesses, but the ability and the resources or the expertise to manage it is oftentimes lacking. It's mm. it's one of the key reasons that we've invested heavily in in our Track and React and Division Bureau infrastructure, which we offer as a service to customers in order to enable them to leverage the information that is available in real time proactively to try and avoid incidents like this particular one. Yeah, and Stan Besedenhout, I see you nodding as well, and I suppose it's, it comes down to the seconds before an incident occurs as well. And Gavin, I'm going to get your thoughts on this from the association side. So Stan, uh, I don't know much about the telematic side. It's why I wanted to hear from Marius, because you've got telematic services. I think it's called geofencing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Marius, I'll come back to you on that one. And then you get normal tracking. When it comes to hazardous material, like uh, was in the Boxburg explosion, I know you've got to skirt quite carefully around this issue, but do we know, was there advanced tracking in this particular truck or was it normal tracking? If it's normal tracking, is that good enough for a hazardous carrying vehicle like this? 
Okay, so just to, to get something straight, the, the typical tracking technology or the telematics and vehicle management technology is typically designed to achieve one of three things. The first is to monitor and manage the movements of your assets. That's to know where your trucks are and what they're doing. The second is to manage and monitor the activities of the drivers. That's where you have live feedback and you've got mechanisms like your geofencing in place, which is coincidentally a software solution where there's a physical area marked and the minute the truck moves a certain distance outside of that area, a controller would be alerted. And the third component is the forward intelligence and, man intelligence and management. Now, if you want to consider whether the advanced tracking was present or not, it sometimes exists where the advanced tracking is available, but it is advanced for the user too. So if you have a controller operating in a particular environment and they're watching the motions and movements of a truck, they might not be technically qualified, skilled or capable of actually interrogating that data beyond the scope of seeing the activities of the truck. As the suppliers will certainly tell you is that some clients utilize the full capacity of their technologies and other clients literally, uh, you know, buy a truck to transport, you know, two little packets of sweets. And this is the unfortunate thing. It's not only a matter of what technology was present, but also the, the scope and, and, and extent to which it was used by the consumer or the, mm. you know, the transporter. And Gavin Kelly, I'm going to have to leave you with the last comments on this. And I suppose it's fitting from an association perspective. I'm learning a lot as I'm going here. And I've heard this from now Stan and, and Marius. And what I'm hearing, and I may have been misinterpreted this, is you can have all the telemetrics, uh, telemetrics, you can have the geofencing, all the tech. But in the end, it's still open to human error. How does the association plan to address that, do you think? Well, Gareth, you know, that's a very, very difficult question to answer in the first bat, because as both gentlemen have said, both Stan and Marius and you, you've actually summed it up, you can have the best technology in the world if you're not going to use it or not understand what it's telling you, understanding the data or realize the warnings or the risk signs that are coming through, then we have a problem. So there are really two things that we need to look at. And the first is that do we need to place a lot of pressure in terms of the entry requirements without them becoming barriers to entry into the sector. So when we register a vehicle and when we register an operator, are we going to ask for far more involved types of systems that would be required? So one of the things we have to do is learn from what happened here. And, and if it's systems that can prevent that, then perhaps that's something we need to bring in. And I think Marius was saying that, that the costs of these systems are, are not as, as high as they used to be. So that's the first thing. The second thing is definitely there is a bit of a gap around the controller, as Stan referred to, or the supervisor in the back office. And perhaps we need to look at a little bit more training in terms of that facility and the communication and the and the constant monitoring of the driver and making sure that that is actually kept where it needs to be. And I, I am running out of time, gentlemen, but I do want to just be fair and give Marius just one very brief response. Marius, uh, almost if you imagine like a quiz show, you've got 30 seconds just to either agree or disagree with what Gavin had to say. How easy would training, for example, uh, be to put into place? Last final answer from you. Gary, it's a, it's a reasonably simple process to do the training. One of the things we often find, though, is that internally um, or a, an external monitored center that specializes in risk management and mitigation is often far more effective at picking things up easily, early, and implementing corrective action. Um, and, and, and frankly speaking, from a risk management perspective, we often see that that is the best way in order to execute it. I certainly hope it uh, can, with proper training, proper implementation, uh, we can avoid incidents like this uh, going forward. It really was horrific. But I thank uh, Stan Besaidenhout on the far right-hand side of the screen, forensic specialist down in the middle, Gavin Kelly, Road Freight Association CEO, and on the far left, Marius van Rien and Mixed Telematics Africa COO. We're trying to just get a better understanding of what happened here and how we avoid it going uh, forward as well. Gentlemen, to all three of you, I thank you very much for your time in joining us here on ENCA.